we are on a ward that we uh, brought our daughter, Lizzie, to in early 2013, late January, beginning of February. My wife, Miriam and I, pitched up here to receive uh, a diagnosis that we had begun to suspect and were dreading, which is that our daughter had a very high risk form of childhood cancer called neurosplastoma. She was stage four, high risk. The prognosis was not good. And we went on to spend the next six months in this building, pretty much in the rooms behind us, uh, experiencing the most extraordinary lows and highs as our hopes and ultimately our fears were realised. So Lizzie had um, one of the most aggressive neuroblastomas I've seen in my, in my career as a children's cancer oncologist. And um, she had a relapse of a disease having had initial control of it through chemotherapy, but it took off very, very quickly. And we still don't really understand the reasons or the mechanisms which cause this kind of very aggressive behaviour to occur in some children. The diagnosis of cancer, childhood cancer, is immediately terrifying for any parent. Um, there are cancers that are uh, eminently treatable and there are those that are extremely dangerous. Um, the fact that it was cancer was frightening enough. The fact that it was an extremely high risk cancer with a very uh, low chance of survival uh, made it uh, trebly terrifying. Well there's only about 100 cases a year of neuroblastoma in the UK. Um, and so in terms of other, other adult cancers it's, it's really very little um, un understood by the general public. However, in terms of a life years lost and the amount of costs to the NHS of uh, treating this disease, uh, the burden is, is really very uh, significant. So there's a very strong case for increased public awareness and increased research. There's also a real shortage of, of research money goes into childhood cancer. It's the, the amount given is really disproportionate to, um, to the um, clinical need. Bizarrely, when we very first noticed that there might be something wrong with Lizzie, it was, um, it was physiological. We uh, noticed a swelling in her stomach and we noticed a swelling on the side of her head. But Miriam's immediate assumption uh, was that this was neuroblastoma. And the reason she thought that was because a very close friend of hers had lost her child uh, at the same age, some years previously, to that disease, showing very similar physiological um, uh, presentations, if you like. So I felt that, uh, how could that possibly be? We couldn't possibly make that diagnosis. It turns out, of course, that Miriam was right on the money. The lesson learned there is never try and second guess your wife. There obviously is the professional level. Um, I think it's very difficult not to get attached because we spend so much time with these families. Um, and with Alex and Miriam, when they were coming in and out, like, I would see them all the time. So you would get attached. And Lizzie was such a delight to look after. You would actually get attached to her, and yeah, I did. Um, and I think it's hard not to. Um, but we also got to remember that we're there to support the families. Um, yeah. So in the months since Lizzie has passed, um, and I think this is very common in all grieving parents, uh, there is a need to continue to uh, raise funds and awareness in her honour. But it isn't just a case of wanting to take care of our daughter, and there's definitely a sense of that. For Mimi and I, and I think for most grieving parents, it is a desire to see that what happened to our daughter and what happened to our family, perhaps there might be a time it doesn't have to happen to anybody else. And, that, and the reality is with a disease like uh, neuroblastoma, that's only going to come about with uh, effective research into an effective treatment and perhaps even one day a year. Probably the focus of, of research in the future is going to be understanding the disease more so that treatment can be much more targeted. At the moment, chemotherapy just kills dividing cells whereas the new treatments are, are more geared towards unlocking the key to, to what is actually making the cancer cell tick. It's through these sort of processes we can have targeted treatments which are likely to give much better outcomes with much less toxicity. So I've been working at Great Ormond Street for 20 years um, and in this role I just love it. I, one of the main reasons why I have chosen this area and have stayed in this area because I feel in my role I can make a difference in a child's life and in ch um, parents' lives. Um, and the day I stop making that difference is the day I'll stop. For the moment, I need to continue. 
It's been a long time since I revisited this place. Uh, it's a long time since I walked up to the sixth floor. Uh, right behind me is Lion Lord, and this walk was a regular one for Lizzie and I. Sometimes walking late, late into the night for hours and hours and hours as we tried to get her off to sleep. It was never easy, but it wasn't always a sad place. And as much as our greatest fears were realized in these corridors, the reality is that we also had a lot of happy times and there were hours without end that I spent with my daughter that I would not otherwise. And, and I'm perversely grateful for that time. Time that we sat in the rooms over here, Lizzie and I laughing like dreams, that I'm reasonably sure had she, not, she and I not had that time here together, we wouldn't have had it all. And so, if ever a place or a building could be filled with more mixed emotions than this, well, I can't imagine such a place. So, it's interesting to come back, it's a powerful, very powerful moment, and I hope it's not the last time that we come here. And I really hope that when Mimi and I next visit, the kind of progress into the treatment of neuroblastoma has had effect and has moved on so that parents like me and Mimi don't need to leave here empty-handed. <laughs>